I appreciate everybody being here today and another welcome. And I also want to thank our panelists for taking time to be here as well. I'm going to allow each one to make an opening statement and then we're going to roll with uh, questions. I've got a few and then we'll offer uh, you guys a chance to ask them as well. So, beginning uh, with General Hipschel. Okay, well, thanks, Doug. Um, as the uh, kickoff speaker, what I'd like to do is establish a context um, for our panel. So let me jump right in. The security and well-being of the United States are at greater risk than at any time in decades. And that's not my statement. That's the grim assessment of the, that's the opening line of the recent report by the Bipartisan Commission on the National Defense Strategy for the United States. Cutting to the essence of the challenge facing the Air Force, Secretary Wilson stated the issue pretty succinctly, quote, the Air Force is too small for what the nation expects of us, unquote. The baseline reality is that the Air Force is operating the smallest, the oldest, and the least ready force in its entire history. Now to get to the reality of what's necessary to meet U.S. security challenges, in the future, Congress mandated in the FY18 NDAA three independent studies to examine alternative aircraft inventories through 2030 and an associated force sizing construct, unconstrained by budget restrictions. Now those reports, I think everyone in here is familiar with the language, are going to come out shortly. Mitchell Institute is coming out with our assessment today, and you should each have a copy at your seat. At the heart of our assessment is the fact that the Air Force has long needed a force sizing methodology that provides it a logical, relevant, and easily understandable means for the American people and Congress to comprehend the tie between the demands of the national security strategy and the quantity and types of aircraft needed to execute it. Specifically, there are two tenets of America's national security strategies over the last quarter of a century that had remained enduring regardless of which political party happens to be in power. The first one is that the U.S. will maintain sufficient forces and capabilities to engage around the world to encourage, shape, and maintain regional peace and stability. And the second one is that the, in the event the United States does need to fight, it will do so in an expeditionary fashion away from American territory in a manner that puts our adversary's value structures at risk while maintaining the ability to win more than one major regional contingency at a time. Now in order to be able to fulfill both these tenets, the Air Force needs a set of robust, capable, and ready forces to establish a rotational base sufficient to sustain that peacetime engagement demand. So, uh, To do that, I think most of you will recall that the Air Force established its Aerospace Expeditionary Force, or AEF construct, and determined that it would take 10 AEFs to maintain sufficient numbers of rotational base forces to fulfill this tenet. With respect to the second major tenet of our national security strategies, the ability to win more than one major regional conflict at a time, historically this has required five AEFs worth of Air Force capability for major regional conflict, or 10 AEFs total. The second tenet was articulated explicitly in the early 90s during the DOD's bottom-up review, and it does remain today. Although language in subsequent defense reviews cleverly reformulated the construct to match the reality of periodic defense budget cuts. Ladies and gentlemen, arbitrary budget constraints, not threats or strategy, have driven the most significant changes to the Pentagon's force planning policy since the 1993 bottom-up review. The return to great power competition and growth of major regional threats such as Iran and North Korea have revitalized this important force-sizing construct. And for more detail, I refer you to the policy paper on the topic. Now, the bottom line is that for too many years, the nation's defense strategy has been driven by the budget rather than the budget being aligned to meet the demands of our defense strategy. With respect to the big rocks that the Air Force needs to address to do that, here are five of them. First, fully funding a robust space architecture necessary and designed to conduct combat operations in space. 
Second, <coughs> revectoring the bomber force to one that grows, not simply sustains current numbers and personnel. Three, correcting the imbalance between fourth generation and advanced generation stealth fighters from an 82 to 18 percent ratio to at least a 50-50 ratio. And that means buying more advanced generation stealth fighters at a greater rate than currently in the FIDA. Four, shifting to a combat cloud operating paradigm where every aerospace craft is a sensor effector node in an ISR cyber strike maneuver sustainment complex. And five, increasing the tanker force commensurate with the needs of the forces that I just highlighted. These are the big rocks, and I know I'm going to take grief from somebody who I didn't mention, uh, and there are others. They're all outlined in the force we need document. So to wrap this up, we've got a choice. We can either fund our military to meet the demands of the national defense strategy, or we can lower expectations of the defense strategy to some uh, level that an arbitrary budget amount will uh, support. But Congress cannot go on living with the deception that what we have in terms of defense budget is sufficient to execute the demands of our defense strategy, because it's not. Gaza? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to build somewhat on what Dave said and maybe deviate a couple places. Uh, so I am the principal author of one of those three studies he uh, referred to that was required by the 28, uh, 2018 NDAA. And uh, I'm embargo from talking about it until uh, the Secretary of Defense has an opportunity to send it to the Hill, which I think is perfectly reasonable. Uh, but I will touch on a number of themes that uh, uh, about the future Air Force, which are pertinent to why we're here today. And the first one is, why did the Congress ask for those studies to be done in the first place? Now, I've been in a number of our quadrennial defense reviews, or DOD's quadrennial defense reviews, in fact, all of them, and, uh, except for one. And I was in the uh, bottom up review helping to find how many uh, bombers the Air Force needed in the future. Uh, every review sent to the Hill, Congress kind of had the same reaction. Thank you. This is informative. It's helpful, but it's not exactly what we asked you to do. We want to know what the defense strategy is and what kind of a force structure, size and shape of force structure is needed to support that strategy at low to moderate risk. What DOD always sent over is, here is our strategy, and here is the best we can do given this budget assumption based on administrative fiscal policy. Now, that's not what Congress wants. So that they did ask for these three studies in the 2018 NDAA uh, to be accomplished without fiscal constraints. Tell us the strategy and tell us what's needed to execute the strategy at low to moderate risk. So that's what we uh, endeavored to do. As we did that, um, I think we, we came up with some conclusions, uh, some of which we started the uh, study with and then kind of proved at, uh, throughout our assessment. Uh, we like to say that our Air Force is the biggest, most powerful, most lethal Air Force in the world. To an extent, I wish we'd stop saying that. Uh, we are, our Air Force is too small, it is too old, and it's not survivable enough. When you start to think about operations in future contested and highly contested environments that could be created by China and Russia. And if we were ever to have to engage against both of those uh, great powers simultaneously or nearly simultaneously, we would lack significant, we would lack capacity in almost every mission area to be able to do that. Our air bases in the Pacific and in Europe are uh, inadequately defended against air and missile strikes that can be launched by China and Russia. Uh, we lack the ability to create the degree of air security we need in contested and future highly contested environments. We lack capacity, we lack capability to do that uh, today. In terms of survivability, 17% of our current CAF combat air force is fifth generation. Um, hey, we're, we're in the second decade of the 21st century and we're only at 17%. Right, that's, that's progress, but we've got a lot of work uh, to do. 
So uh, without going on much longer, leave time for the rest of the speakers. That's why I think it's time that we step back away from the truism of our Air Force is the most powerful, <coughs> most lethal, et cetera, Air Force in the world and start saying we have some significant issues for the future given this shift toward great power competition in deterring and if necessary defeating um, aggressive uh, uh, China and Russia. That doesn't mean to say that we don't have the best airmen in the world and we darn well do. JV? Yeah, thank you Doug. And thank you Mitchell Institute for having us uh, and uh, for you all being here today. A couple quick remarks. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, capacity and capability, and I'm with the Heritage Foundation. We've done a couple of uh, long-term studies on capacity. I want to talk a little bit about that and then uh, talk maybe an insight or two about uh, capability uh, that's associated with that. Heritage uh, numbers historically from 1950 until today, every major regional conflict that we've had, on average, we've needed 500 uh, fighter aircraft, and then we look at that as the pyramid. You need bomber force, you need tanker force, and every um, ISR asset and space asset associated with that. But big rocks, and you may have heard the president talking about this uh, during the election um, two or three years ago, 1,200 total uh, combat-coded fighters is what we need as a force in order to do, basically have the capability, the capacity to do two major regional conflicts. What's lost in that number is those are combat-coded fighters. That doesn't include any of the other fighters that we need, training assets, uh, RTU and the like, operational test and evaluation, and it does not include any guard or reserve assets whatsoever. When we talk about 1,200 fighters, it's an easy number to remember. It's an easy thing to, to project. And knowing that that's the pyramid under which everything else is, is built, then, then that's helpful, but it's also hurtful when you focus on just 1,200. Um, the Secretary's expansion to 386 uh, 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 total uh, squadrons talks about bringing us up from the level where we are in combat-coded fighters. She doesn't use those terms, but right now, if you were doing an assessment of our force, we got 965 combat-coded fighters that are out there in operational units right now, and that goes from A-10 all the way up to the F-22. Her expansion brings us just short of that 1,200 number, but again, we're not talking about total, total fighters in the force or total force structure, just the combat-coded aspects of it. And I'll leave that uh, as far as capacity as a conversation that we have a little bit later. Capability-wise, I, 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 my first assignment was as an OV-10 pilot. If you want to talk light attack aircraft, I can talk to you about that quite a bit. Um, my second assignment uh, was into the F-16. I've got the, al almost 3,500 hours in the F-16, but when I was going through RTU, RTU folks are basic uh, knocks. They don't know anything about BFM when you're coming into that world. And, and I had the opportunity to fly a couple BFM sorties, basic fighter maneuvers, classic dogfighting, like you know from World War I or World War II. And then I, I got to go out and I got to fight an F-4. High aspect, we were separated by 20 miles, we met in the middle, and the first engagement, if uh, you fighter pilots want to talk, it was a two-circle fight. And, and I, I actually got inside of his turn circle because of my, my turn rate capability and extraordinary thrust to weight ratio. I got in and I gunned him in less than uh, 180 degrees of turn. In a high aspect fight, that's for an RTU student facing two crusty majors in the F-4, that was interesting. We, we went and we fought several more engagements, and then we go to the debrief. And I was playing the, 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 the tape in the debrief, and back then you didn't have stop and start. You had to fast forward. And, and these two crusty majors are looking at me, and I'm a young captain, and they're grumbling to start with. But we go to the first engagement. It was a valid gun kill. And then I'm fast forwarding uh, to the next engagement. When I got back to my point and the F-4 got back to his point, we called fights on. I turned back toward the F-4, locked him up. He was halfway through his turn at 240 knots at 11,000 feet. I was at 24,000 feet at 450 knots. And my plan was to come in and coast. And, and I, I wasn't thinking, I was just fast forward. And, and, and the, the pilot of the F-4 said, you stop the tape. And then he used a lot of profanity. And he goes, what the is that? And I go, 
I, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And he goes, what the hell are you doing at, at, at that altitude, at that airspeed? He had been in full afterburner from the time we left our engagement, went down to the South Point, and was still struggling to come up to a fighter uh, engagement speed and altitude. And I had gone just in military power back to my point coming back in. And, and it was at that point that I realized the stark difference between those two generations. It allowed me to operate in a realm that I was basically untouchable with that F-4. When we talk about generations going from third generation where the F-4 was to fourth generation, the F-16 that I flew in, stark difference. When you talk about going from fourth generation to fifth generation, you're talking about maybe even a larger leap. The F-35 and the F-22 can operate in a, in a domain that other fighters cannot imagine right now. And, and that's where capacity and capability have to come into play in this conversation. I'll leave you with that, and sir, uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Don. Well, it's good. I just, JV, I want you to know that as a, a former F-4 pilot, Yes, yeah, Stutz was one of the majors. You were <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you're old. It wasn't the best generation of aircraft, but, it, but the pilots were the best generation. <laughs> and the best looking, I might add. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to talk a little differently but and uh, give you my our opinion uh, at Mitchell that uh, defense resourcing, caution, 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 may be at a high water mark, and that projection of funding for the Department of Defense is probably solid regardless of what happens uh, with who reigns in Washington, D.C. And uh, this should keep us up pretty much at night because the Air Force has had an amazing uh, story of delay in its modernization. It's now working through a bow wave of programs that can't be off track. Uh, the strategic urgency of this uh, you know, changed, as General Deptula said, with the aims of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And it's not like the return to, high, uh, to uh, highly contested peer conflict surprised us. In fact, in the mid-2000s uh, on the air staff, the chief and secretary at that time were working very hard to preserve the F-22, as you recall when it was, uh, uh, the requirement had already been chopped to 381, uh, and it was uh, from 700, and then it was, of course, terminated at 187. The Air Force was continuing to view that they had to be ready, the U.S. Air Force, with its aerospace power for that high-end, will come back again, pure conflict. A lot of the Pentagon was diverted, uh, of course, according to a different philosophy, that the long war was going to pursue and what was happening in the world would probably make pure conflict uh, less probable. So what we saw back then from the staff is what you, many of you saw, which was the rise of the pure competitor that was going on even back in the mid-2000s, working against the American way of war and pursuing technologies that were being cut in the U.S. Air Force. They, both Russia and China, of course, pursuing fifth generation capabilities and beyond. So what this, of course, is left for the Air Force is a number of programs and they can't be off rail. Uh, let me just run down, you know, the B-21 bedrock of U.S. deterrence in the future. Uh, the requirement probably right now being stated, talked about, is way low. That cannot be an off rail program. The KC-46, if anything, analysis is showing across the board more tanker support is needed uh, to meet the aims of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And by the way, that program is doing much better than many other DOD program, acquisition programs. The Air Force has got to be careful it doesn't continue to somehow have this stigma as being off course. UH-1 replacement, General uh, Hyden at Stratcom, Muses that 20 years ago, he wrote the first requirements document. It's a major. That's got to proceed ahead. He talked a lot about fifth generation aircraft, and I won't go into that anymore, but uh, you can go on to the ground based strategic development. <coughs> There's a number of space and cyber programs. They can all 
not be off-rail, that bow wave of modernization is delayed. Two more things quickly. One is that Air Force capabilities need to be thought of more broadly. And two I'll throw out there, we have a paper out, or Mitchell out, that uh, you can take a look at. For example, bombers being thought of as high leverage in the counter-maritime mission. Uh, the MQ-9 Reaper, a tremendous system of systems that should be thought about more broadly in terms of mission sets, whether it's air-based defense, uh, whether it's also counter-maritime. And then maybe we'll have some time to talk uh, a little bit about light attack aircraft in the Q&A. Uh, no, I appreciate it, gentlemen. For one thing, for those of you that don't know these individuals, each one of them is an operator. And in fact, they're really the only operators of think tanks working aerospace issues, which makes them quite unique <coughs> in their views. So, Joan, the tool, first question for you. We've heard a lot of talk about budget and whether this is a high watermark, you know, whether you look at the deficits that are currently being run, if you look at where the interest rates are going, and if you look at the mandatory spending accounts, there is a lot of pressure there. How should you see that impacting the Air Force's strategy as they go forward with their acquisition? Um, well, it's a, it's a complex uh, question, but, but let me offer that, yeah, we may have seen the high watermark, but I haven't given up yet that at some time this Congress, maybe not this Congress, but the, the A Congress and the American people will have a serious discussion about prioritization and priorities in federal spending. Um, I think everybody has their own opinion on the balance of spending between guns and butter, but no one can argue with the preamble of the Constitution. And the preamble of the Constitution says that we form this government to, quote, provide for the common defense. Then there's a comma, then it says promote the general welfare, unquote. It doesn't say the other way around. <clears throat> so we've got to get control of entitlement spending. Unfortunately, frankly, I'm concerned that it's going to take a catastrophic event before Congress realizes the importance of fully funding defense to the level needed to meet the demands of the defense strategy. Now, with respect to Air Force priorities and, and budget strategies, I think what the Air Force has done with their force we need uh, construct is exactly what's been needed for over 20 years. And that's an honest assessment, just like Gonzo talked about, everyone talked about it to a bit, of just what's needed to meet the demands of the defense strategy. And I also hope that by laying out that force, it signals a, re a return for each of the services in the entire defense department to return to a construct of establishing a planning force as well as a programming force. Now, for those of you who haven't been in the business, you know, all we've been doing in the Department of Defense is offering up one kind of force since the early 2000s, and that's what the budget could allow. The planning force is a construct where each of the services articulate what it is they need to meet the requirements of the war plans around the world. Okay, and so, uh, look, I'm pragmatic. I understand that that most likely is not going to get fully funded. But by identifying a planning force, like the Secretary did with a 386 operational squadron, uh, and where we are today with 312, people then have uh, a means to identify the difference between what it is we need and what we actually have, and that's translated into risk. So if you're willing to take a, a, a certain amount of risk, this quantifies um, what that risk might be. So um, that's the path I hope that the services go down. Uh, I haven't given up the aspirational goal that we need to fully fund our strategy, like I said in my opening remarks. Or the other thing you do is, is change the expectations of the defense strategy. But let's not fool ourselves that we can operate globally uh, without the resources to be able to do so. Any other thoughts? I'll, I'll just offer one quick thought. I really like the idea of planning force and the programming force. The difference between the two, of course, represents risk. Clearly laying that out to the Hill, I think, would really help inform them and inform the decisions they need to make on how to best allocate our nation's resources. Uh, I will say one thing that's a little bit different than what uh, General Otula said is uh, we, we shouldn't figure out what force is needed today 
to actually um, support current war plans. We should go beyond that. It's more than war plans. It's what is going to be needed in the future, our future war plans to deter our, uh, our peer competitors, uh, and if necessary, to prevail over them in a, in a conflict or more than one conflict uh, nearly simultaneously, uh, as well as how new emerging technologies could help us operate differently, what resources are needed to build that into the future for us. So you have to look beyond today's war plans and think of the future and lay that out in your planning for us as well. I think you would agree with that. Yeah, I don't think I said just today if I did. Okay, no, you know, it wasn't um, just today, you just mentioned more about it. But if we don't even have what we need to fight today. Fair point. Much less the future. Fair point. JV, you talked about the fighter shortfall that we're currently experiencing, and the Air Force leadership is really hammering that they have to get to 72 aircraft produced a year uh, to avoid a serious path in the 2020s. As Stutz highlighted, we really can trace that back to the F-22 cancellation in 2009. <laughs> You've also hammered the importance of B-21 on this panel. You can trace that back to the B-2 B being curtailed in 21 airframes in the 90s. With this budget environment and the bow wave that we're currently looking at for acquisitions, it's going to be tempting to cut something. You know, J-STAR has obviously already got the hook last year. Um, we're seeing light attack uh, getting kicked down the road. When you look at these trends, what do you read from them? Are you risk and managing it? Well, we're already deep into risk, and when we talk about the managing risk, uh, it's basically managing the risk that we're already managing and basically uh, continuing to make cuts in our readiness in that regard. Uh, not to hammer the age of the aircraft too much, but that F-4 that I fought in that uh, scenario in 1987 was 20 years old. It's 20 years old, and now uh, you look at the generational replacements that the Air Force has programmed over the years. Generally, every 15 to 20 years, we have a fighter. We almost completely skip that generation because of what, or that replacement schedule, because of what happened in 2001. And, and so you look at where we are with the F-4E, it was 21 years old. The F-16 is now 29 years old on average. The F-15 uh, is now 34 years old on average. And so when you talk about a concerted effort and a, and a well thought out effort to replace those aircraft, you go into the F-22, what is that air superiority replacement? Uh, Secretary Gates decided to um, take smart risk when he cut the requirement for uh, what we needed for air superiority in half and, and cut the purchase down to about 180 or so F-22s. 160 of those are operational uh, in that ballpark, but when you start doing the math, you can cut that number in half because of the readiness rates of those aircraft. And we, we don't have the capabilities in the air in that regard that we need, but Secretary Gates went on and doubled down and said, we're going to have the F-35 in number. By 2020, we'll have a 1,000 or more F-22s and F-35s in place. And, I think uh, General Deptula came up with a number that will have something less than 300 total in uh, 2020, which is about eight months away, nine months away. So we're way behind on this, and when you, when you have a hiccup and you sit back and start saying, well, why don't we skip the fifth generation by and go right to sixth generation, that would be skipping two generations worth of fielding uh, aircraft. We're going to need aircraft to fight a war in eight to ten years. Six generations not going to be on board then. We need to ramp up the acquisition program for the aircraft that we have on record right now and going back and buying an F-4 to replace an, an F-35 is not what we want to do. But when you're looking at 10 or 15 years from now and we start talking about fielding the sixth generation, going back and buying a fourth generation platform is the same thing as if we were buying a third generation platform now. It just doesn't make sense. Concerted, well thought out, we, we need to get back in that ballpark. It's going to cost money, and, and we need to apply those resources to it. Gonzo, with the force we need, uh, with the Secretary's announcement last fall, which I think we're all happy to see, when you talk about growing the force, you also have to talk about metrics, about how you evaluate the attributes of it. Can you talk about some of those elements, please? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to phrase this. Or, uh, um, talk about how you take a look at various capabilities, uh, current, future, and uh, how you should assess them against other capabilities we might invest our, our precious uh, national resources in. First and foremost, the metric, Captain Obvious point, 
It's aligned with priorities of the U.S. national defense strategy. If it really isn't, if it isn't going to help us to deter great power aggression, compete with great powers over the long term, then uh, perhaps that would be a candidate for something else other than an investment. Um, we should also assess the lethality and the survivability and other attributes of these uh, weapon systems against the future threat environment, not just today's environment or even the environment over the next five to ten years, especially for weapon systems that are going to be in the force for 20, 25, 30 years. Are they still going to be effective 15 years from now, or are they just going to help us in the very near term, and then we'll be in the inventory sucking up dollars and resources to sustain it for another 20 years? Um, we should also, and this is really important, consider are they going to give us more than a marginal improvement over what we already have in the force? In other words, are they going to enable us to execute new operational concepts, operate differently in the future than, than we uh, do today, to gain a real advantage uh, against our, our enemy forces? Is it going to allow us to do something we can't do today, such as uh, create the degree of air security we might need in the future in highly contested airspace. We cannot do that today. Uh, cost. Obviously that's the criteria you have to look at. And it's not just procurement and sustainment costs. You have to think more broadly about cost. Okay, but this is cheaper than that. And we can buy more of these than that. And I'll give us more capacity today than that will. Great. What if we have to fight China? What if we have to uh, fight Russia. What might the cost be in terms of attrition, in terms of us failing in a mission, and so forth? You have to think about that as well. I'll stop there. No, appreciate it. Can I uh, just add the gun to it here a second? Uh, we're involved in some uh, war gaming workshops that were very interesting, and uh, the propensity, uh, guns, and make just a, an amazing point here that uh, there's got to be value there, and the propensity of the war gamers was to uh, completely jettison today's force and, and stock up on tomorrow's capabilities that were truly game-changing. Uh, and there is, uh, and that makes sense, it's logical, but really we can't just flush the force we have today. Correct. It has to migrate in that direction. Correct. So there's going to be a period here where the force we have and programs need to be uh, looked at in terms of making that force able to migrate to have much higher leverage capability and to be able to use it in different ways until we get to that that uh, new force structure out there at some point. Stutz, question for you. Light attack, obviously, the Air Force is choosing a different path on that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, interesting, different path, uh, and we uh, had a very substantial discussion with the Air Force chief. Uh, about this, uh, we remain, I remain a tremendous advocate of light a a attack aircraft of what it can do. Uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, why, uh, you know, the, the notion that we might uh, be flying F 35s in orbit someday over the Middle East or uh, some primitive <coughs> environment is horrifying to think that the waste, the cost, the, the burn on the airframe. Uh, consumption of life uh, span of those high-end assets. Uh, light attack aircraft allows the majority of the force to be focused on getting ready for the high-end, highly contested environment and fighting in that environment. We know that's atrophy over the last generation of non-stop stop combat operations. So, there, yes, there's a tremendous cost efficiency, but these light attack aircraft are going to have tremendous capability. And, uh, you know, there's other benefits, too. Uh, the Air Force needs to expand the cockpits it has to have a, a larger uh, population of pilots. We know that affects many of the acquisition and other programs, having the lack of operational expertise. Uh, there's a concern there. But where, where the Air, Air, Air Chief is uh, leaning is something that's pretty exciting, and that is uh, still looking at the light attack aircraft as being a very important capability to build real partnership capacity in uh, countries that can't afford fourth gen, new fourth gen or fifth gen aircraft. We're talking about uh, being able to operate at a high level of effect 
but doing it in airframe they can afford and maintain. To do that, however, the Air Force has got to get serious about buying some of these because, uh, frankly, you know, the indications are no country is going to buy an aircraft the Air Force is not committed to. So whether that's, you know, what number that is and where they are and what they do, we need to watch carefully what the Air Force is doing in its continuing experiment, which I think will be built permanently as a, a, a function out at Nellis. And uh, we need to continue to talk about the value and need to look at a light attack aircraft. Well, I know people here want to ask about Space Force and other topics, so I'm going to throw it open to the audience. Just please identify yourself, your affiliation, and wait for microphone. Thank you. Uh, John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Um, there are reports that the Pentagon might request uh, funding for a certain number of F-15X fighters and the FY20 budget. Um, and I wanted to get uh, each of your uh, takes on, you know, whether you think that would be, um, in, in addition to you know buying the F-15X, uh, perhaps buying fewer F-35s than have been projected or some had hoped. Um, so I wanted to get your take on, like, you know, from a, a budgetary and uh, capability and capacity perspective, whether you think that would be a good idea or the Pentagon should just focus on the F-35 and not really buy any F-15Xs. I'll, uh, I'll take a first stab at that, John. Thank you for the question. Um, the uh, F-15X is a very capable airplane. Um, uh, the number of munitions it can carry, the range of it uh, is, uh, is really up there. Um, the investment is not insignificant. If you look at uh, the numbers inside the Pentagon or outside, you're going to be able to buy more F-15Xs than you will be for the uh, F-35. But it goes back to General Sessering's uh, comments about being able to employ those as well as Gonzo's. Uh, in any environment in the future. And you're going to have an investment right now in a platform, whatever you buy. Uh, if, you, if you went back and bought a fourth generation, any other platform, it's gonna be around for 30 to 35 years, just like the, the, the fighters are now. We're gonna stretch it out as long as we can. And any fourth generation platform in places like uh, on the fringes of Syria, Afghanistan, certainly Northern Africa, they'll be able to operate uh, for the next 10 years, I think, pretty well. Beyond that, you're not going to be able to use them, I don't think, in, in many other environments, not even in a habitat. Uh, when you're talking about uh, protecting uh, tankers or ISR assets, uh, if, I, if I'm a um, uh, Chinese uh, J-20 or an, uh, a Russian Su-57, I'm, I'm the ninja that's going to be sent after those assets to make sure that you don't have them. Uh, I know you don't have many of them. So I'm going to take them out. And so this is where the F-15X, I think, falls short. It, it would not be able to survive in that environment. And it will not be good for the long term. This is not the F-15X, it's any fourth generation platform right now. That investment is like going back and investing. And in, in, in 10 years, we're gonna be talking about the sixth generation fielding. You'll be talking about two generations behind it that'll be around for the next 20 to 30 years beyond that point. So. In my humble opinion, it, it is not a good investment for the Air Force to make. Any other thoughts? I'll just uh, remind you that when uh, the Secretary of the Air Force submitted the budget uh, to uh, Office of Secretary of Defense, um, it didn't have any fourth generation aircraft in it. The other thing I'll remind you of is that ratio <coughs> that I talked about at the beginning. And uh, uh, Gonzo mentioned it too. You know, currently we're sitting at a 17% uh, uh, fifth generation force uh, and uh, an 83% fourth generation force. Uh, if you look at the priorities in the national defense strategy, where are they? Well, they're aimed at uh, a, a, a rapidly increasing capable China, who, by the way, uh, are fielding two fifth generation fighters and working on a next generation uh, bomber. Uh, so, you know, we need to prioritize uh, in the context of the aircraft um, uh, that we need. Uh, and, and John, I'll just ask you, you're going to be the lead pilot in the first aircraft that goes into a double-digit surface-to-air missile, highly defended environment. 
and you got a choice. You can be in an F-35 or you're going to be in an F-15X. Which one do you want to be in? Probably the F-35. You bet your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you're going to be doing. I uh, have Steve Trumbull with Aviation Week. Uh, so I take from, from this report that um, you're um, proposing to reconstitute the AEF model as a foresighting construct for the Air Force. Well, first, if I may, it never has been used as a foresighting construct. It was used as a force management tool. Okay? There's a big difference. If you go back and you look at my words in the context, look, it has to be easily understandable. Okay? That, that's key. But yes, I'm, I'm, what I'm proposing is adapting the AEF construct as a force sizing mechanism for the Air Force because it's very easy to understand. Let, let me give you an example. Look, in order to maintain the sufficient rotational base to engage around the world during peacetime and to be able to fight if we have to do so in an expeditionary fashion, for example, using the B-21 numbers, I need a minimum of one squadron of 12 B-21s per AEF. All right, that's 10. 10 times 12 is 120. There's my 120 combat coded requirement. Now I need 25% for test and training, and I need another 25% for backup aircraft uh, inventory and attrition reserve. You add up all those numbers, you have 180. Now, I just took you from national security strategy requirement, those two key tenets, to specific numbers of aircraft, 180 of B-21s, in less than, what, 30 seconds? If I, if I can and I can do that with every air, every every aircraft in the inventory, and that's what we've done in this report. So I, I just wonder, um, you know, the AF construct dates from a time, right? So it predates the fifth generation fighter, right. fleet, and aircraft like the B twenty one. And when we hear about exchange ratios of twenty to one and upwards of red flag for those aircraft, does that change anything about the assumptions that we make? In sure the does. The a absolutely, sure does, and that's what goes into the. You know, the decision, don't forget, you know, uh, you, you, there is military judgment involved in making these decisions. And you raise a very good point, and those numbers can be adjusted as a result of the new capabilities that advanced aircraft bring on board. Hi, Pat Host from Jane's. Uh, I have a non-budget question, but I do have a question I'd like to get operator opinion on. So the F-35A's gun has an accuracy issues, and it's had issues for the last couple of years. I understand the F-16 and F-15 has also had gun accuracy issues as well. Um, how important is it to operators that a fighter jet's air, uh, gun works properly? <laughs> Holy cow, you're really opening a can of worms. I was just out at Hill, uh, interviewed uh, another 30 uh, F-35 guys. They're firing the gun actively out there, but uh, in their words, it's, it's uh, the correlation between where the sight is and where the bullets go is not exactly there, I think is a, a kind way of saying it. They're working on it. Uh, if you, the dynamics of being able to sight a fourth generation uh, gun sight with an internally mounted cannon are, are complicated. You've got the cannon on, on off to the side, but the canopy is really thick. So you've got this grazing thing where your gun sight has to be fixed, associated with the distortions that the canopy has. That we went through with that with the F-16, the F-15, and, and and they worked that out. Those complications are significant, but you've got a fixed sight in front of you. If that makes sense, with a helmet-mounted sight that they have in the F-35. That gun sight is now moving every time the pilot's head moves. And now you've got the canopy corrections and the likes. Lockheed Martin, they'll work this out. Um, and, and it'll just take some time, because they're just now really getting into the gun, right? So how important is it is the second side, Pat? And I, I love that question. Um, what can kill a stealth airplane? A stealth airplane is uh, right now, it's got some really good treatments on it where you can't hit it with a radar missile. Uh, you know, you can, but it's harder to. You have to get in close. And you can deny most assets' ability to do that with a radar missile. Heat seeking missiles that you can always, I mean, you will always be able to decoy those off with flares. Almost always. You've got the hope. What defeats a gun? Nothing. And if you get in close, uh, you can kill any platform with a gun. So is it important? It will always be important. In the air, 
it will always be important on the ground because you know if you get a uh, your most uh, highly precision small diameter bomb it has a blast frag radius that's still significant and if I wanted to shoot bad guys that were twice as far away from me as that that wall is from me right now I can do that with a gun and I can take care of bad guys and I can make sure I don't hurt the good guys in the process hard to do that with any other ordinance guns important Good morning. I'm Deanne Divis with Inside GNSS and Inside MA Systems. Um, since the Space Force was mentioned, let me take the opportunity to ask about long-term budgetary considerations. We're looking at long-term constraints. Uh, the stand-up will take five years. The, the budget for that five years seems limited, but beyond the five years, to me anyway, it's not entirely clear. Um, from your perspective, how do you see the Space Force impacting the, the needs of the Space Force, in fact, the priorities that you've been discussing this morning. Um, let me jump in there. First, um, there's this presumption that we're going to go ahead with the Space Force. It, 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 that is not necessarily the case. Um, the Congress are the ones who have the uh, prerogatives and the authorities uh, to stand up uh, another uh, armed uh, service. Um, now, well, I would suggest to you that Space Force is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, the Department of Defense avoided a disaster by not moving forward with an entirely separate department of the Space Force, but no one should be high-fiving because they came up with a less bad solution. Uh, look, uh, the question of standing up an armed service uh, for space is, is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but the when needs to be conditions based uh, for when those conditions are necessary uh, to stand up uh, a space force. So I would tell you currently there are no space arms which are the fundamental purpose of setting up an armed service. How do you set up an armed service when there's no ability to fight uh, in or from space? Um, constraints to fully weaponized space capability need to be debated and they need to be changed by Congress to allow the Air Force to mature space warfare theory and concepts of operation for fighting in space. And these are the prerequisites for establishing a new armed service. Now, everyone's been focusing on the Space Force, the Space Force. And not much attention has been given to what I personally believe is the solution to the legitimate concerns about the priority and the importance uh, and the threats uh, to our space uh, capabilities. So the stand-up of the combatant command, U.S. Space Command, uh, to focus on these challenges is appropriate. All right, and, and that is in, that's in the plan. Uh, you know, back to the, the, your question in terms of the amount of time that it would take, the amount of resources that it would take. Nobody's also talking about the people. These are the same people, whether they're in the Air Force, in a Space Force, or in a Space Unified Command. Uh, so where are we going to get the people to populate all these different organizations? Um, that's why I believe that the, 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 the best solution is to stand up a Unified Command for Space which is a, is a well-known uh, organization. I mean, Space Command actually existed uh, until, I, th I believe it was 2002 uh, time frame. Uh, and it involves all of the services, uh, and we can, we can now spend attention on getting to the issue of, you know, how do we best prepare and invest for combat in space in the future, as opposed to rearranging, uh, you know, chairs on the deck of the fourth floor E-ring. We've got time for one more. Hi, Vivian Mashi with Defense Daily. I was wondering if uh, some of you can talk a bit about where you see unmanned aircraft fitting into your your uh, priorities here. Last year, the Mitchell Institute had their manned unmanned combat teaming report and you mentioned the report, you know, opportunities for MQ-9 for close air support. There's been talk about unmanned aircraft kind of fitting into whatever comes next after JSTAR. So can you talk a bit about where you see those priorities and how they might help uh, improve the readiness levels that you'd like to get to? Thanks. Go ahead. 
I think there's an important mix, um, and there always will be. Uh, where we are right now with the capabilities in the F-35 and the F-22, um, it doesn't take much to go another step and say you could actually um, have one of those platforms unmanned. Uh, uh, Boeing's got a pro program right now, uh, manned unmanned teaming, uh, which really uh, looks promising. Uh, to go in into a high threat, highly contested environment, um, in, in, in even in a sixth generation platform, if anyone is thinking that's going to be without risk, it just makes you competitive in that environment. It allows you to have a, a leading edge on beating the threat, but it doesn't mean that you're going to get in unscathed. And the more players that you have, the more noise that those players create in that electronic environment. When I say that, I, it, it sounds like it's a, a cold thing. I want more targets out there. I want more um, noisemakers out there so that the guys that are flying can be successful and, and these buddy systems that we have, at least for the foreseeable future, um, have a pairing where uh, we do extraordinary things and we, we start minimizing the human cost associated with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, let me just jump in real quickly and add that, you know, 10 years ago when I was uh, the policy person actually responsible for the you know, over 600% growth in our remotely plotted aircraft uh, inventory, we used to talk about how where we were then um, was about where we were in the status of manned aircraft in the 1920s. This is 10 years later, so I guess we're about where we were in the 1930s now. Um, uh, but enormous potential for, uh, uh, you know, the terminology is still something we've got to deal with. Uh, we're, because we're going to remove from remotely piloted to much more autonomously employed systems, but we also have to be careful that we don't mislead people with the terminology um, because a human will always be in the loop when it comes to employment of, uh, of LIPO force. Uh, but a, there is a, enormous potential for the future, not just with combat aircraft, but come on, I mean, you, when you look at um, uh, cargo aircraft, when you look at tanker aircraft, there's absolutely no reason why those aircraft can't be unmanned today. I'll offer uh, one quick comment. Uh, I think it's high time that our nation invests in a true unmanned combat air vehicle. It's multi-mission. They can do counter air. They can do strike. They can do long-range strike. They can do airborne electronic attack. They can perhaps do some cyber missions in the future. Um, I will tell you, though, uh, there's been a lot of debate maybe more in the past and recently about unmanned systems replacing manned systems. What's the potential for that? I, I think it's the wrong question. Uh, the real question is how can we take the attributes of manned systems and unmanned systems and combine them in ways that are synergistic and again allow us to do things that we can't do today or really take that next leap ahead in, in capability. It's the combination of the two which I think is so important. Well, with that, we're at time. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you for all of you attending. Appreciate it.